Many Nuzlockers, including myself, usually have an unspoken rule that we follow, that being having a ban list of Pokemon. These could include Pokemon that you find far too strong, Pokemon that you've already used many times before, but most often than not, these lists include legendaries. And it makes sense, right? Like these are supposedly the strongest Pokemon in the given game, and in many cases you can use them right out of the box. But I've been rethinking this recently and the validity of it, because as most competitive players will tell you, the title of Legendary is just that. A title. It gives you an indication of what stats to expect, but it doesn't really speak to its viability. And this is the third time I've gone through this. If you haven't already, please check out my previous two legendary only runs where I give a more expanded pitch. But in short, what we discovered was that 3 out of the 4 legendaries I used were actually kinda bad. And not in a relative to other legendaries kind of way. They were bad in the sense that they were outclassed by regular Pokemon. Ones people would usually never consider banning. Last time we used what many people considered to be the worst trio. The Regis. And to my surprise, they all did really well. Not ban worthy for sure, but they all had their solid uses and niches that made them stand out compared to other Pokemon. So to one up that, I figured the best way to move forward is to use what I consider to be the worst legendary trio. Pokemon that I honestly can't believe past the design stage with how similar they are to each other. That of course being the Lake Trio. These Pokemon are all psychic types, with similar movesets, and all share the ability Levitate, the only thing setting them apart being their stats. And while that certainly is important, unlike the Regis, they all share the same typing. So even if one is better defensively, if we're up against a Dark type, we're screwed either way. You already know the rules of a hardcore Nuzlocke, so I'll paste them on the screen to read at your own pace, but to summarise, I can't use items in battle, I'll be playing on set mode, and we'll have level caps. Let's see if I can convert some people to really kill these Pokemon instead of my poor golems. So like I said before, the stats are the only thing that really define them aside from a move here and there. Azelf is by far the best one, focusing on attack with his high offensive stats and almost equally impressive speed. It's also the only one that gets fire type moves, which will be like the only thing we have to hit steel types. Yuxi is the defensive one while also being surprisingly fast. That is certainly a niche that not many Pokemon fill. Whether it's actually a niche that will be useful to us, we'll find out. Which brings us to Mesprit, who's there for emotional support. Seriously, this Pokemon's just bad. Mesprit balances out its attack and defense, leaving both to be pretty okay. They're certainly not bad, but considering it doesn't get many good moves, this just kind of leaves it in a limbo where it's the worst of both worlds. And it's the slowest one! Come on, give us something! Basically, we'll be using Mesprit flexibly to fill the roles of either Azelf or Yuxi to a much lesser degree depending on the battle. I gave them nicknames that reflected their most defining features. I mean, his back sprite kind of looks like a pompadour. If it was a wig he was wearing backwards. Now, while I did say they were bad, I meant as a team. Azelf, however, by itself is a monster. It has an attacking stat of 125 in each offensive stat and a speed of 115. Even with a very limited moveset, literally only confusion, Azelf tears through the early game trainers and it's not even begun its rampage. Rogue Belly even gets a chance to attack, though this does immediately outline our main weakness, one we'll be seeing very commonly throughout this run. Dark types. At this stage in the game, we don't really have access to many TMs yet, we actually won't for a while, and like I said earlier, their coverage is really bad, specifically their level up learn set. The first attacking move they learn after Confusion is Swift at level 21, one level below our next level cap, and then they don't learn any attacking moves until level 51. 51! That's after we've gotten our last gem badge. Would you believe me if I told you they had it even worse in Diamond and Pearl? They don't even get an attacking move until level 21, being stuck with the rest until then. The Regis got superpower at level 26, and hey, at least Explosion does damage. Meaning we're stuck with Confusion for our stab, a base 50 power move for pretty much the entire game, unless I allow the game corner TMs. Oh sorry, they do all get future size, how foolish of me. If you remember the upcoming boss battles, this doesn't bode well for us. And of course the boss battle I'm talking about is Team Galactic Grunt B, where the only Pokemon he has is a Stunky, and the only damaging move we have being the aforementioned Confusion. So you wanna guess what I do? I PP stall the f Not even two badges in, and I'm resorting to such tactics. Thankfully Stunky has no dark type moves, and we have rest to recover any damage we take. What Stunky does have, however, is Fury Cutter, a move with 15 power points, Focus Energy, a move with 30 power points, Screech, a move with 40 power points, and Poison Gas, another move with 40 power points, 110 power points we need to burn through before the second gym. 
Thankfully, I have the mental fortitude of a monk for these things after my ditto only run in Shining Pearl. At least this only took me 12 minutes with speed up instead of 40. Not exaggerating. Oh, and would you believe that we actually do have access to a TM? One that I always forget about. Rowan gives you the TM for return, which could have taken care of this battle in one turn. I have no one to blame but myself. Speaking of return, this one move is a godsend. The power of return is based on the friendship value of the Pokemon, the max power being 102. Meaning right out the gate, we actually have a 102 BP move that we can give to Zelf as we can max out friendship immediately. And because his physical attack is equal to his special attack, this will be even stronger than our Stab Confusion, which was already nuking Pokemon left and right. And more importantly, a move that can actually hit Dark types, which trust me, we're gonna need really soon. Honestly, if we didn't get Return, this would have likely been a dead run without some cheating. But the next boss battle, while tough, should be pretty straightforward. Zubat goes down to a single confusion, but out comes Perugly, who is very fast and has decent attack for this stage in the game, making Perugly a pretty scary early game boss. I decide to stay in to just do as much damage as possible before needing to switch out, but fake out crit on the first turn. Not a good start to a battle I was already concerned about. Well, assuming the next one doesn't crit, we can stay in for one more- it, it has a dark type move. I don't know why I'm forgetting so many things about this game. Well, we survive, but that complicates things a little. Well, nothing to do but switch out, so we're already needing to rely on our tank. Yuxi. Thankfully, I guess I was in range for a scratch, so we take far less damage than we could have. Perugly outspeeds to use Fane's attack, and Yuxi tanks it pretty well. Confusion doesn't do too much, but even after the berry, it looks like it could two shot. Even if we can't take two Fane's attacks, we have Mesprit in the back, so we should be fine. Unless we get crit. And Yuxi survives on 4 HP. We can't survive the next one, but we have Mesprit. Unless we also crit. I'll take it. So there was no chance of us losing this battle, but spoiler, we most certainly are not going to do the rest of this run while missing one of our pixies. There are far scarier boss battles in the future that we'll need the whole gang for. And unfortunately, one of these boss battles is coming right up. Gardenia is very easy, us just being able to spam confusion while not taking much damage in return. We do get paralyzed, which could have screwed us over, but we come out only needing to use ourself. But next, we have to do the first of the many boss battles I fear. Jupiter. She starts off easy with Zubat, who can just one-shot with confusion, but this was to lull us into a full sense of security, as next up is Skuntank, and Skuntank is terrifying, especially this early on. Skuntank is a dark type, and unlike the Stunky that we fought earlier, it actually has a dark type move, and not just any dark type move, it has Night Slash, a move with a base power of 70, which is pretty strong this early on, especially when it's super effective, but that's not what's the scary part. This move also has a boosted chance to crit, and crits in this game do twice the damage, meaning at any given moment, regardless of how well I play, there is always a looming 1 in 8 chance that I straight up lose. Because playing around crits is not really a thing when you only have 3 Pokemon, all of which are weak to said move. So how far does our first attempt go? Azelf does outspeed hitting a return that manages to do over half, but triggers the berry needing us to hit 2 more. Skuntang doesn't even wait a moment to use the dreaded move, and as expected it does well over half. Now we need to hit two more, but we did over half last time, so maybe we can get a high roll? No, of course not. A Night Slash finishes Pompadour off. Into Mesprit, and to my surprise, our slowest Mon is able to outspeed and finish Skuntank off with Swift, winning us the dreaded boss battle. But of course, as I'm sure you figured out, this boss battle isn't dreaded because we can't win, it's because we need to win with all of our pixies alive, and this run is effectively dead. Now this was the expected outcome. I came into this battle knowing I was going to lose, I just wanted information. Knowing how much return does and that all of our mons can outspeed is big information. I would have also liked to see how much Swift did, just get a better idea of what I have to work with. But that's what second runs are for. This time I lead with Yuxi, who can one-shot Zubat and can outspeed to use Swift, revealing to do about 25%. This was kind of expected, attacking is not Yuxi's forte, but I was hoping for more. Skuntank uses a Screech, sharply lowering our defense, but that's fine as this will tell us how much two Night Slashes do to bulk cut. I wasn't expecting him to survive three anyway. I stay in for another Swift, which leaves Skuntank just below the threshold to activate her berry, which gives me an idea. Bulk cut seems to be able to comfortably survive two Night Slashes, provided there are no crits. I switch into Pompadour, managing to eat a Night Slash, and outspeed the next turn to hit a return, which doesn't manage to get the kill, us losing our second run. Now based on the damage Pompadour took, I really doubt Mesprit can survive two hits either, so using all three to do damage seems risky. One will end up dying the same turn they use an attack. And this leaves us in a tough situation as we don't really have many other tools to use at this point. We're kind of starved for TMs that we can learn, and there aren't many items that we have access to. Sort of.
So there is actually one TM that we can get really early in the game, and I hate that I already have to rely on this strat. In Orbora Gate, once we have access to Rock Smash, we can traverse the lower sections. To get the more useful items here, you need a bike and also surf. But we're only here for one thing, something we only need Rock Smash for, the TM for Flash. A move every one of our pixies can learn. This move lowers the accuracy of the target by one stage, and you don't need me to tell you where this is going. I typically don't cheese boss battles this early, but this is the second time I've had to do something like this in a legendary only run. One more thing I grab is a Chester Berry. These can be replanted unlimited times with no restore Pokemon, so we now have a bottomless pit of these. These can be used in tandem with the move Rest to wake us up immediately, giving us a free full heal once per battle. I honestly should have used this earlier, but with our new toys, let's see how we do the third time. I once again lead with Bowl Cut, who I told Flash to as he can survive two Night Slashes. We can outspeed to land the first one, and Skuntank misses turn one. Best case scenario. Now we have a much better chance of chaining them. Third turn, however, Skuntank lands a Screech, which halves our defense, which is just about as good as landing a Night Slash. Maybe a little worse. A fourth Flash, and Skuntank even hits a next move, Night Slash. Which doesn't crit. We use a rest restoring all of our health and then wake up immediately thanks to our berry. This is why I would have preferred being hit with the Night Slash instead of Screech. However, Skuntank hits a third move in a row, meaning that didn't really matter. Now we want to switch into Dreads, hoping that we don't get hit with the fourth move in a row. Which of course it does. Why wouldn't it? I've only used four flashes. And Dreads tanks. It could probably survive another, just barely. I use a Swift doing a little over 25%, and finally a Night Slash misses. I think as long as we don't get crit, we're free. I use another, triggering Skuntank's Berry, and she hits yet another Night Slash, which Mesprit does indeed survive. And now she can outspeed to rest up, as Skuntank misses the next one. One more Swift, and even Skuntank seems to have given up as it misses a Poison Gas. And now we can switch into Pompadour, and as long as Skuntank doesn't crit, we're in the clear. And Skuntank misses. We use a final return, which can indeed do enough damage to finish Skuntank off this time, getting us past probably one of the hardest early game bosses I've fought. Look, yes, I know I kind of cheese the battle, but sometimes we have to use these strats when we're limited in what we can use. I think this can lead to a somewhat consistent battle, but I did get pretty unlucky after the first few misses. At least now we can actually attempt to play the game as normal. You poor naive fool. Right after fighting one of the bosses that counters our team, we have another boss that counters our whole team. Literally the next one, that of course being the ghost gym leader, Fantina. Unfortunately, getting confusion early did come with a price. As in Diamond and Pearl, you don't need to fight her until you've gotten 4 gym badges. I like the changes made in Platinum, but this fight's gonna be hell to get past. Fantina uses 3 ghost Pokemon, all with some pretty strong ghost moves. And would you believe it? We don't have access to a single new move or item that will be useful to us since our Jupiter fight. We just have to straight up go in with what we already have. So let's see how our first attempt goes. Spoiler. Bad. Very bad. Fantina starts off with the Duskull, which may not seem harmful at first, but Duskull has three moves, all of which are a pain in the ass to deal with. It has Pursuit, a 40 BP move, which doubles in power if you switch out that turn. It has Shadow Sneak, a ghost move, also super effective, which also has priority, meaning it will always outspeed us when she uses it. And it has Will-O-Wisp, a move that burns us and will keep doing passive damage. And Fantina seems to pick these moves at random. Dreads needs to 3-shot it, but the second one lands Duskull in the red, triggering Fantina Fantina to use a potion, completely restoring its health. And this is after Dreads got burned, meaning we're taking passive damage all the while. I decide to rest up the second time Duskull is on the brink of its second death, and thankfully it outspeeds to use Shadow Sneak, meaning we'll be restoring that extra damage. And it doesn't even use Shadow Sneak the next turn, meaning we can use a Confusion, putting it down while being at full health for our next Mon. Which turns out to be Miss Magius, the Pokemon that haunts my dreams to this day. Miss Magius is incredibly fast, has pretty high special attack, and gets Shadow Ball, a super effective ghost move with 80 base power. Unlike Skuntank, we can hit it with psychic moves, however, it is immune against Pompadour's return, which is arguably our strongest move. It even outspeeds to use Confuse Ray, with Dreads of course hitting herself immediately. Next turn, Miss Magius goes for the Shadow Ball, which does an insane amount of damage, well over half our health. Bear in mind, Mesprit could take two hits from Skuntank. I have to switch out. Into Bolkart as Miss Magius uses another. And Bolkart looks like he can survive one more. Just barely. Unfortunately, it looks like Ms. Magius can even outspeed Bowl as she uses another Shadow Ball. Bowl surviving on 4 HP. 
I make a poor attempt to use our last strategy, but this will be the only flash we'll be able to get off this battle, as Ms. Magius will outspeed to kill us the next turn. I have no other choice but to sacrifice Bowl Cut for a safe switch. What am I even supposed to do? We still aren't at a point in the game where we can freely sacrifice our Pokemon, and we truly have no new tools this time around. Not even a move like Flash. And there's really no point in narrating the rest of this battle. Dred is able to dodge two hits luckily enough, burning Miss Magius' berry and bringing her below half, with Pompadour being able to finish the job, as at least he can outspeed Miss Magius, even outspeeding to one-shot haunt her winning the battle. We're through, but two of our Pokemon are dead, and there's no way we're doing the rest of this run with just one. Another dead run. On my next attempt, I'm actually able to beat this battle pretty easily, only needing to sacrifice Bowl Cut as I lead with him. I get enough flashes off on Miss Magius to miss fairly often, and the sack allows us to bring in Pompadour safely, being able to dodge enough Shadow Balls to whittle Miss Magius down, and outspeeding to rest up when needed. Like, beating this battle is not really an issue, but how are we supposed to keep all of our mons alive? Well, I mean, this is the furthest we've gone, so we may as well continue. Now I won't bore you with this run for too long, I know for a fact that we need all of our mons alive for an upcoming battle, so this was me just testing some stuff out. One thing I wanted to check was whether allowing the game corner would make me overpowered. Pompadour was able to obliterate the trainers on the way to Veilstone, and once we're here, we have access to the game corner. Here we can buy some really good TMs, which will not only give us Psychic, a 90 BP Psychic move upgrading our pathetic confusion, but also moves like Flamethrower and Thunderbolt, which are very strong fire and electric moves with no downsides, both of which Pompadour can learn. Platinum is one of the few games where you can consistently get a lot of coins by abusing the Clefairy bonus rounds in the slot machines. I'll link a video that explains the more intricate details, but short story, we can get unlimited coins relatively quickly without any risk to our Pokemon. However, I found that this made most of the game far too easy. I don't think this would help with some of the future bosses I have in mind, but that doesn't mean that I want to just have a free win button for the bosses in between either. I don't think I want to ban the game corner TMs outright, as there are a couple of TMs that could be useful without breaking the game, which we can only get there. Well, this run ends in failure to occur it anyway, on a battle I'll say for later, as it ended up being one of the harder ones, which I didn't initially expect. But back to the drawing board. We most certainly need all of our pixies alive. And I won't sugarcoat it, I think we'll need to solely rely on luck for Fantina. Well at this stage, Jupiter's pretty consistent, we're just left to the whims of R and Jesus whether she lands the 1 in 8 crit or not. This makes her less free, but we can pretty consistently get past her. Fantina, however, took me 3 more attempts. This time I lead with Bowl Cut. Dusk all straightforward, spam Confusion 3 times, hoping it doesn't do enough damage to put Yuxi in range of Shadow Ball. And once Miss Magius comes out, use the first turn to rest up so I'm at full health, or I could hit myself in Confusion. Rest up successfully the next turn, however, having enough HP to take two Shadow Balls. Interestingly, this is the first time I learned that in Gen 4, using Rest doesn't heal your confusion. Never knew that, but that sure is annoying for this battle. Luckily we snapped out the turn we use our first Flash, and Miss Magius even misses her next Shadow Ball, giving us a free turn. It does hit the next Shadow Ball, however, meaning we need to be content with just three Flashes. Funnily enough, on the switch to Dreads, Miss Magius uses the far weaker Magical Leaf, which is an always hitting move. Hopefully she's baited into just using these now. She's not. But Mrs. Shadow Ball. And then Confuse Ray. Our second confusion even confuses Miss Magius instead. Not that it hits itself, but it's something. At least it misses. And then snaps out the first turn. And even hits the Shadow Ball. Amazing. At least we were able to use two more confusions before needing to switch out, burning her berry and bringing her low. Now, as long as we don't see a crit, we can safely bring in Pompadour to outspeed and finish Miss Magius off. Good lord, that does a lot. I do end up using a rest, hoping for a miss, but even better, Miss Magius just goes for a magical leaf, doing far less damage. Confusion finishes the job, and while Pompadour does get hit with a sucker punch, we were safe even from a crit. Confusion one shots and gets us past Fantina with all of our mons alive. Now, while I did get past this battle multiple times, this was special as it was the first time I got past this battle with all of my mons alive, and I certainly never intend on doing this battle again. Yup, never again. Would you believe me if I told you that this isn't even the most terrifying battle in this run? It's probably the most inconsistent one, but with speed up and rare candies, it takes like an hour at most to get back here. The ones I'm thinking of, however, are like a good 10 hours in. Anyway, with all of our pixies out of the grasp of the Grim Reaper, we've now got a run full of potential. Oh boy, a dark type TM that Azelf can learn. That sure would've been helpful, huh? I do grab the TM for Shockwave, as we no longer have Thunderbolt for now, and give it to Dreads. She needs some firepower. Wait, what? Oh god. Driftblim somehow manages to land an Omni Boost from its first Ominous Wind, and we can't even outspeed to kill anymore. Alright, that's fine, let's not panic. Bolkart's got this. 
It does more than half. This is a random trainer. Please tell me I don't have to do that all over again. It was a roll. We survive on 2 HP. Are you serious? Bulk up, why? It's over. And it uses Gust on the switch to Dread. And Dread survives the next ominous wind. God, we're so close to losing yet another run. This was just a random trainer that we're forced to fight. How did I not struggle against them last time? Well, without access to the game corner TMs, Maylene's a bit tougher since we don't have Stab Psychic anymore. But there were no rules against me just buying TMs from the department store. Here we can find the TM for Fire Blast and Thunder instead, which while more powerful, are a lot more susceptible to miss. Not great for Nuzlocke's, but good enough for now. And finally, while leveling up, here's one of the reasons we really wanted Yuxi alive. He learns Yawn. A move that basically lets us put the opponent to sleep for free, as long as we can survive two turns. But I don't foresee that being a problem with Melee. I lead with Pompadour, but Meditite survives the first return. This lets her use Rock Tomb, which crits, also lowering our speed. We don't want a speed debuff this early, so I switch out to Dreads as she gets hit with another Rock Tomb, doing less this time. Meditite outspeeds this time, but goes for the far weaker Confusion for some reason. We finish her off with our own. Next is Machoke, who does manage to outspeed now, but we eat, so two Confusions. Or we speed tie, I guess. Finally it's Lucario, and the first thing I want to do is switch out to Bolkart, as he gets crit by Metal Claw. At least Lucario doesn't get the attack boost, and now we can test out our new move. We get hit with another Metal Claw, and we can get off a Yawn. And since we can survive one more, I set up a Reflect for good measure, as Lucario falls asleep. Into Pompadour. Now despite Fire Blast having a chance to miss, it's not really that high. It's got an accuracy of 85% compared to Thunder and Blizzard's 70%, and with how much damage it does, there are situations where it's actually probably better than Flamethrower. That being said, we of course miss the first one we use. Well, we outspeed so we can try one more time, and a super effective Fire Blast is indeed enough to one-shot Lucario. I think you can see why I banned the game corner TMs. We were able to completely sweep this fight with the Zelf. Imagine him, but with an actually good psychic move. But moving right on to Crash Awake, this battle can be a bit tough depending on the whims of one Pokemon. We teach Pompadour Thunder over rest. Chances are that in this stage of the game, he probably won't benefit as much from the free heals. Wake leaves with Gyarados, and I send out Dreads just to be on the safe side. We do manage to outspeed, and a 4 times effective Shockwave doesn't get the kill. Come on Dreads, I'm trying to make you useful. Gyarados does have a super effective bite, but it does less than half. Wake heals, but since we outspeed, two more shockwaves takes care of that. And we're already on the ace float cell. Now float cell's kinda scary as it's fast, has a pretty decent attack stat, and has crunch. Which does almost half to our bulkiest Pokemon. We should be able to survive one more, so I stay in and set up Reflect. I was hoping to use Yawn, but didn't expect Crunch to do so much. So now it's gambling time. Into Pompadour, who instead takes a weaker Brine. We outspeed, and manage to hit Thunder turn 1. And it's able to one-shot Float Cell. Finally it's Quagsire, but poor Quag can't really do anything to us. And then he even misses Rock Tomb. And then gets crit. Poor Quag. But with that, we've netted our fifth badge. Only took us eight runs. But I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. Let's hope I didn't just jinx myself. We're onto the second half of the game now, and this is where things are about to become a bit more difficult, as if they already weren't. All thanks to one man. Before moving on to the next gym, we have our first battle with Cyrus. Cyrus absolutely sucks for us, as he primarily uses Dark-type Pokemon, and even Pokemon that aren't Dark-type have Dark-type moves to hit us. Well, this is only his first battle, so thankfully Sneasel doesn't have any Dark moves. I just use a return to make sure that we can two-shot. It does hit us with Screech, halving our defense, which makes things a bit more difficult. One more return, and out comes Murkrow. Now one Thunder should take care of him, but there's a 30% chance to miss, and Murkrow has decent attack. This one even has a dark type move, which with the defense drop would one shot us. So into Bolt Cut, as he takes a faint attack pretty well. We can survive a non crit, so we stay in to use a reflect, and now back into Pompadour. And yeah, we can survive at least another two. And we miss the first Thunder. Why did I expect anything else? Murkrow does go for a Nightshade, which I think does more now, but it's better as it can't crit. We can survive another, so I stay in for a Thunder, which hits and one-shots. Next is Golbat, who I would've liked to Thunder again, but our health's kind of low, and Golbat has Bite. It's weak against Psychic though, so into Dreads as it uses an Air Cutter instead. I forgot the Reflect was still up. Well, we have to stay in now, so Golbat outspeeds to use Bite, which crits, and then we get flinched. Okay. This is pretty bad. We took about 60 points of damage, so we should survive another, but we can't really afford to get flinched. 
Dreads takes another bite, surviving on just 5 HP and doesn't get flinched. We can rest up to recover all of our HP and wake up with our berry. Mesprit manages to avoid getting flinched again and two more confusions take Golbat down. Only his first battle and we already almost lost him on. Mainly because we had bad luck, but still, it'll only get worse from here. This was a lot easier with Thunderbolt and Flamethrower. Well, with Surf, we can take on the next gym. But before that, we have another rival battle. And would you know it? This is the one that I lost my last run to. I've been skimming over the rival battles up until now because there wasn't really much to say. But this one can genuinely be really difficult. Mainly because now Barba uses a team of fully evolved Pokemon who hit pretty hard and he has 5 mons now. Barba leaves with Staraptor and I send out Dread who absorbs the Intimidate. Staraptor hits surprisingly hard with a neutral takedown and we hit a super effective shockwave doing about 75%. We take another takedown bringing us low and another shockwave finishes Staraptor off. But out comes the main reason he's terrifying for us. Heracross, a bug type Pokemon. Now Heracross does have the fighting type but it also has a pretty high special defense. And with Confusion still being our best psychic move, we can't one shot. And while Heracross doesn't actually have a bug move for some reason, what it does have is Night Slash. The super effective high crit move again. Another battle where there's a 1 in 8 chance we just straight up lose. Bowcut looks like it can survive a crit so the first thing we want to do is put it to sleep. And we also outspeed. Bowcut gets hit with Night Slash which doesn't crit. Well, we outspeed and can survive a crit, so I rest up on the next Night Slash as Heracross falls asleep. Now we have a free turn, so let's test out how much confusion does, and yeah, not much. Set up a reflect as Heracross stays asleep, and the next turn another confusion as Heracross wakes up to use a Night Slash, which does far less damage now. And then we can outspeed to finish Heracross off with a third confusion. God, this was far harder without Uxi. But we're still only down two Pokemon, and we've taken quite a bit of damage already, which is concerning. However, he decides to send out Rapidash, a physical attacker while our Reflect is still up. So we can pretty safely send out Pompadour on the weak takedown. We can now speed hit return, and a crit getting the one shot. Actual revenge this time. I deserve that. But next up is Empoleon, who is actually pretty scary. Aside from being a special attacker, we don't really have many moves that can hit it. We only have Thunder, which has a chance to miss. And even if it does, it doesn't kill. Which wouldn't be too much of an issue, but the starters have abilities which I always forget about. These abilities increase the powers of moves of their respective typing if their health is below 30%. From almost full health, Pompadour gets brought down to 25% by Bubble Beam. Now we're in a bit of a conundrum. The reason I gave our rival Pipple up is because Empoleon's a part steel type, which resists Psychic. That's about as much thought as I put into it, but now it resists both of our accurate moves, which I don't think will kill, leaving us with Fire Blast and Thunder, both moves which can miss. Both Dreads and Bowl Cut are low, so switching is probably not the best idea. So I stay in for Fire Blast, and it hits, finishing Empoleon off. But we're still not done. One more Pokemon left, and at least this time it's Roserade, who's weak to all of our Mons. But like I said earlier, all of them are pretty low now, so it's not exactly free. I switch into Bowl Cut on the Giga Drain, doing about 20 points, meaning we can survive two more. And we want to put it to sleep as fast as possible, as it sets up a layer of Toxic Spikes, which since all of our Mons have Levitate, is useless. Use the Confusion as it falls asleep, and get a free switch into Pompadour to finish it off. Possibly the longest fight we've had so far. Look what he did to my Pokemon. Last time I think Empoleon was the third Mon that came out and it just crit Pompadour with Bubble Beam. I think that was for the best because I don't know what I would have really done afterwards. But with him out of the way we can take on the next gym and god this was an annoying gym to get through. Like I said we don't really do well against Steel types and the only move I had to hit them was Fire Blast with 5 power points. Meaning I had to go back to heal every 5 Pokemon, 4 if one missed, or just let a single battle take 5 minutes. We do have electric moves, but when most of the Pokemon are Magnemite or Steelix, it doesn't really matter much. This doesn't really lead anywhere, I just wanted to complain. Byron's pretty easy, but he does have one annoying move. Magneton goes down to a single Fire Blast, and the Ace Bastiodon's already out. Now under any other circumstances, is a complete joke. It's 4 times weak to both ground and fighting, and even then it can't really do much in return. If you can one shot it. If you don't however, Bastiodon has a chance to use Metal Burst, which acts like a combination of Counter and Mirror Coat, reflecting back the damage you do, but instead of twice the damage, it's 50% more could still be really annoying. And as you probably guessed, we have zero moves with either of those typings. And look how little Fire Blast does. Of course, Bastiodon uses Metal Burst on the first turn, returning back massive damage, forcing us to actually think for this battle. 
I miss a thunder the next turn, which may have seemed weird, but I want to say fire blast for his next Pokemon. But if I do zero damage, metal burst will do zero damage. Stone Edge, on the other hand, does quite a bit, and also has a high chance to crit as well. Fun. Well, we can't use Pompadour anymore, so switch out to Dreads. As Bastiodon fails a Metal Burst, I told Dreads Grass Knot for this reason, and it does way more than I wanted it to because it crits and doesn't even kill. The berry takes Bastiodon out of heal range, but now if it uses Metal Burst, Dreads is done. But it wastes a turn using Taunt. One more Grass Knot doesn't finish it off, and it uses Taunt again for some reason. I don't understand the AI. <sighs> And Byron heals, meaning we have to go through this all again. Grass Knot looks to be a 5 hit KO. And then he proceeds to use Metal Burst for the next two Grass Knots. Why? At least we shake off the taunt so we can heal up with the rest as it taunts again. Grass Knot still doesn't get a kill, and Byron fails another taunt. Has he not learned anything? One last Grass Knot, and Bastiodon finally goes down. Lastly, it's Steelix, but we can just spam Grass Knot while Steelix can't really do anything to us. It has Flash Cannon for some reason, a special move, coming off a base special attack of 55. Don't let people gaslight you into thinking the older generations were far much harder. And that's Byron. Honestly, not a difficult fight, just a really annoying one. But I wanted to showcase this as, like, when is Bastiodon ever marginally going to be a threat again? In fact, if it didn't waste turns taunting, it could have actually been a close one. We hear explosions in the distance, creating shockwaves which we can feel in the city miles away. Rowan, being the responsible adult of the group, decides it's best to let the 10 year olds investigate, as they've had less life experiences and therefore have less to lose. While Team Galactic have been kicking our ass this challenge, at least this time we fight Sasson, who's probably the easiest out of the four bosses for us. Bronzor gets one shot by Fire Blast, Toxic Croak to Confusion, and Kadabra to Return. Rowan feels the need to vent out his anger on a minimum wage worker instead of the manager, so we're forced to help Dawn out and have another battle with Mars. Honestly, with our range of moves, this battle isn't nearly as scary as the first one. While Pompadour did get poisoned early, Perogly is basically shut down after setting up a reflect, with Faint Attack doing very little, and us putting it to sleep with Yawn. A few returns take care of it, and Bronzo to a Fire Blast though I probably shouldn't have risked that. Rowan stays true to his values as when concerned about one of his pupils, instead of using a Pokemon to fly to Snowpoint, which he presumably has visited at least once during his 60 years of existence. He sends another 10 year old to brave the harsh conditions of the Sinnoh Snowscapes, only equipped with the scarf to stave off the bitter cold. Barbara can hold on to dear life for a little longer, as we have a gym to beat. Now Candace, don't say it, is actually kind of bad for us. All because of one Pokemon, and some stupid stuff it can do. But that doesn't make the rest of her team easy either. Candace starts off with Sneasel, who's pretty fast and actually knows the dark type move. So I decide to risk the Fire Blast from the start, and manage to hit, getting the one shot. And our Sleep Paralysis Demon is already out. Frostless, another ghost type Pokemon with Shadow Ball. Except now, instead of us spamming Accuracy Cheese, it's her turn as she has Double Team. Now her coming out early is actually very good, as Frostless has the ability Snow Veil, which boosts her evasion and hail, and Candace has a Pokemon in the back that can set up hail as its ability, which is permanent in this game. None of this matters however, as Pompadour is a demon in his own right, hitting another Fire Blast, getting the one shot. Can he do it a third time in a row? He can. And finally, it's Pilot Swine, who's the first to dodge the Fire Blast. Stone Edge brings Pompadour low, so we bring out Dreads on one that misses. A couple of Grass Knots, and that's Candace taken care of. Wow, that ended up being a lot easier than I expected. It helps when I don't miss every move, and we can actually outspeed the Ghost type this time. However, this was just the start of the gauntlet. With the seventh badge, we now have the climax of the Team Galactic storyline. And out of all of the legendary only challenge runs we've done so far, this may just be the hardest section for us. Rowan's having a power trip, so he sends us on a new mission, this time to the headquarters to file a formal complaint. I really don't want to be here. While storming the base to find the manager, Pompadour gets the chance to learn Nasty Plot, an amazing move that increases our special attack by two stages. I actually decided to let it go for now as we can learn it later, since our strongest move is still Return, which is physical, but I regretted that later. Onto our second fight with Cyrus, and this one's much worse than the first. He still starts off with Sneasel again, who still doesn't have a dark move and falls to a single Fire Blast, but out comes the evolved Murkrow. Haunch Crow, who now sports a massive attack stat and is also bulkier. A return isn't killing for sure, but now I don't even know if Thunder will, if we even want to risk that 30% chance. Since we haven't taken any damage yet, I decided to play it safe and use return to guarantee some damage. And it crits. 
Not even killing, that means it would have taken three hits. Hauntra uses a super effective feint attack, leaving us in the red. That wasn't even a crit. But thanks to our one, we can now speed the next turn to finish Honshkro off with another. Honestly, that crit probably saved us. It at the very least allowed us to avoid needing to use Thunder. And we get another crit. That one didn't matter, but we take our victories where we can. But it's not over yet, as next is the evolved Golbat. Crowbat. And this time it can outspeed all my mons. Considering how last time it stunlocked me, I wasn't looking forward to it. But with how well Hornchcrow went, we have a much better chance. Despite Crowbat having a super effective move, it's not really that strong, so I feel pretty comfortable staying in for a bite. Though I should have been more careful. And the first one flinches. Alright, back to my regular luck. We need to switch out, and Ball Cut's the best one to take the attacks. And like last time, Crowbat goes for an air cut out on the switch, as I guess I was in range of that. I'll take it. Unfortunately, I saw Bulk Cut Light Screen over Reflect and forgot to teach it back for this battle, so instead I go for Yawn. Or I would have if I didn't flinch. This puts us in a rough position as now we can only survive two bites, but Yuxi's able to push past to get off Yawn. We're out of range of another bite, so I stole a turn using Rest as Crobat falls asleep. This gives me a free turn to use Confusion, revealing that we barely do any damage. So, I do what I should have done this turn, and switch out to Dreads as Crobat stays asleep. Crobat is still asleep, so we get a free Confusion, doing about twice as much as Bowl Cut. Crobat wakes up, and then misses Supersonic. A final Confusion, and that's Cyrus 2 down. This battle could have gone so much worse. If we didn't get a crit, our Pokemon likely would have been in a much worse position for Crobat, who could have likely cleaned up afterwards. I could have played this better by reteaching Bowl Cut Reflect. But this is only the beginning. We discover the shady secrets hidden within the dark underbelly of this very legitimate corporation. I knew the spikes on the side of the building were a bit fishy. Saturn's been making clones of our late guardians this entire time. This is my video idea, not theirs. Plagiarism's not cool, so after humiliating him a second time, he allows us to delete his work. But I'm smarter than that. I'm a software engineer. I know Saturn only let me delete his local copy, so we have no choice but to scale the heights of Mount Coronet, so that we can catch the data floating in the cloud with our bare hands. And what better way to reach the cloud than from Spear Pillar, the highest peak in Sano? Unfortunately, Team Galactic saw through me and already had an army of grunts at the ready. They're not really much of an issue for us, but coming up is likely one of the hardest battles we'll have this run. Not only do we have to fight Mars yet again, but this time she's joined by Jupiter for a double battle. Skuntank and Perugly in a double battle is pretty bad, but that isn't the main reason this fight sucks. Alongside these things, we're forced to fight this double battle with Barry, and Barry is one of the worst double battle partners in the mainline campaign. Barry leads with his weakest Pokemon, Munchlax, a new addition to his team. Munchlax has four moves, Body Slam, Screech, Stockpile, and Swallow. Only one of them is an attacking move, and it's a normal type. Both Pokemon out are Steel types. Screech could be useful as it lowers the opponent's defense by two stages, but it doesn't really matter if Barry never attacks. And boy, does Barry like using these other two moves, as the only purpose they serve is keeping Munchlax alive longer. This would have been fine if it acted as a meat shield, but with most of their Pokemon having strong moves against Psychic, we're the prime target. Meaning, three out of four turns, we just have a wasted party slot. To Munchlax's credit, it does use Screech first, which isn't the worst move it could have used, but I still would have preferred a real Pokemon. And the big Skun Tank's already out, still armed with a super effective high crit chance Night Slash. Please Barry, just attack. And it does almost 75%. Yeah, that citrus berry isn't helping here. And then Bronzor doubles into me using Gyro Ball, putting me below half again. See, he's not even serving his purpose as a meat shield. And Munchlax uses Stockpile. It begins. Well, we need to switch out, so best to bring out our bulky bowl on the Night Slash, which does just less than half this time. This time Bronzor targets Munchlax, but we don't really care about Bronzor's attacks. Barry, please. I figure it's just best for its content to sleep, so I use a yawn and get hit with the Night Slash, which still doesn't get a crit. Bronzor confuses Munchlax, making it even more useless, and Munchlax hits itself. Well, better him than us. We're low, but we can now speed to rest up as Skuntank's Night Slash still doesn't get a crit. Bronzor once again targets Munchlax. Munchlax surprisingly snaps out of confusion early, and even uses a body slam on Skuntank, doing quite some damage. And then the fucker paralyzes him. Barry, even when you attack, you still can't do it right, you idiot. If you're wondering why that's bad, this means Skuntank won't fall asleep this turn, and now we can't even bring Azelf in to finish it off. Yuxi literally cannot touch Skuntank, and Mesprit doesn't have the firepower to finish it off quickly. We are almost entirely reliant on Munchlax attacking her now. I decided to bring Drez out for now, as I can at least whittle Skuntank down a bit, but Bronzor sets up another light screen, meaning we'll do even less damage. 
Skuntank once again uses his Night Slash, seemingly doing exactly half, and Barry once again hits Body Slam. Alright, sorry Barry, maybe I jumped to conclusions. Since Barry attacked, I decided to at least lower Skuntank's attack by using Charm, essentially halving it. We get hit with the Gyro Ball, and Skuntank can't move. And to my surprise, Barry actually hits Body Slam again, finishing Skuntank off. You know, I've always been too judgmental. Your first few attacks scared me, but credit where it's due. Finally, all Jupiter has left is Golbat. If we can finish her off, the rest of the battle will be a clean sweep. To be safe, I decide to rest up to recover my health. Golbat of course targets me again using Sludge Bomb. At least that sort of tells me that it doesn't have a Dark type move this time. Munchlax gets set by Bronzor, and this time Barry goes for a Screech. Alright, can't all be winners, but at least we got three good moves from him. I begin attacking Golbat, Confusion revealing a three-hit KO. Would be quicker with Barry's help. Still no poison from Sludge Bomb, and Barry uses another stockpile. Okay buddy, you did good, but I'm starting to get a little worried. We use another confusion, and this time both opponents double into Munchlax. I would have loved to see this more earlier. And then Munchlax hits itself. That's fine, at least it's not us. One more confusion finishes Golbat off, and now this battle should be free. Unfortunately, Bronzo uses a light screen again, so it's gonna be far harder to take it down if Barry doesn't attack. Munchlax hits itself again. Alright, we're back to Barry being a net negative again. I bring in Pompadour so we can start doing some damage, and much like snaps out of confusion. Only to use Swallow, restoring back all of its health and resetting its stockpile. God damn it, Barry. We use a return, doing well over half thanks to Screech, and get hit with the Gyro Ball, which puts us in a pretty bad spot, since we already used our Barry. But Barry does indeed attack this turn, Body Slam finishing Bronzor off. And out comes Perugly, and contrary to her previous battle, Perugly is a massive threat this time. Now she has Shadow Claw, basically Night Slash, but a Ghost type, which is also super effective against us. The only Pokemon that we have that can survive a non crit is Bolkut. Oh, and she also has Slash, which too has a high crit chance. Barry, now's not the time! This sucks. I'm not sure if Shadow Claw will kill or not, but I can't switch out. Perugly surprisingly fast, outspeeding to hit the Shadow Claw, but we survive using a Yawn. Barry, Screech is not the right move here. But what do we do now? Perugly outspeeds, so it can finish Bulk Cut off, but I also don't know if the other two mons in the back can take a Shadow Claw anymore. Dredd is still pretty healthy, so I bring her in on the Shadow Claw as it crits, putting Dreads down. Barry, do something! Oh well, I suppose there really isn't much we could have done against a crit here. Well, Perugly's asleep now, so we at least have a free turn. The multiple, one might say too many, Screechers allow Pompadour's return to one shot. Oh, and that turn Munchlax was going to attack. How convenient. But it's still not over. Last is Golbat, and I'm honestly not even sure if he can survive an attack from it. A Thunder might kill, but if it misses, then this runs over. May as well get off some guaranteed damage with Return, and this Golbat of course had Bite. Goodbye, Pompadour. Barry, I fucking hate you. I hate you so goddamn much. I bring out Bolkart, hanging on by the edge of his life, and we manage to outspeed using a confusion, which is indeed enough to bring Golbat down, putting us past this battle. But at what cost? Are you serious, Barry? Are you actually saying that to me? Did you let that skunt tank kill get to your tiny little reptilian brain? No sh hit a wall. Bet you hit a wall on the way out of your mum's womb. Fully healed who? Two of my Pokemon are dead. That's right, run away. I hope you run into a fing wall. Alright, that battle sucks and I could have definitely prepared better, but I got some of the worst luck with him. This is a problem in a lot of Pokemon games surprisingly. In double battles with your friends, they always lead with their worst Pokemon. Well look how the tables have turned. Bolkart has gone from being the first one to perish to being the only one who remains. How will he fare against what is possibly the hardest battle in the game for us? Good hustle buddy. And that's another rundown. Well, that's fine. We now know what we're doing, so we can just do a little speedrun to get back here in no time. Oh, I have to do that battle again. God, I hate Barry. Alright, we're 45 minutes in and I'm starting a new run. Don't worry, there really isn't much to go over this time, as most of my run goes about the same as my last one. So we can skip most of this stuff, and I'll only bring up some key changes. Unfortunately, we still have to go through Jupiter and Fantina, who are both very much problems for us, and are still pretty inconsistent. Honestly, Jupiter isn't too bad anymore, as long as we don't get crit, but Fantina, I'm still stumped on. This time I decided to grind up my Pokemon until they're just about to level up. This means I can switch them all out on Duskull, as even a boosted pursuit doesn't do too much. Then Bolkot can finish Duskull off, leveling up all of the Pixies past the level cap, which is fine as the battle's already started. 
I didn't think this would matter at first, but this basically guarantees that Bulka can survive two Shadow Balls after resting. We do get confused, but Bulka hits the first flash and even snaps out of confusion to get off another. Unfortunately, Miss Magius goes for another confusory and we hit ourselves, meaning we already have to switch out. Dres manages to dodge the Shadow Ball and switch in, and Miss Magius is locked in on Magical Leaf as we whittle it down with confusion. And then Miss Magius gets confused and it even hits itself. And while it manages to push past the next turn, Shadow Ball misses. Unfortunately, Confusion still wasn't quite enough to get the kill, and Miss Magius got into heal range. Well, if Fantina's gonna do it, I may as well too. And then Miss Magius snaps out to confuse us instead, but Dreads pushes past that, hitting another Confusion. And then crits, putting Miss Magius back into the red. Alright, one more. Miss Magius misses Shadow Ball, and we snap out of Confusion. One last Confusion, and Miss Magius goes down. Still not over as we have Haunted next. It outspeeds hit Confusory and Dreads hits itself. Try one more time. Okay, Shadow Claw does a lot and we hit ourselves again. You know what? Doesn't matter. Dreads did great this battle. Into Pompadour on the Shadow Claw and we can outspeed to one shot with Confusion. This is probably the luckiest Fantina battle we've had. I should have just done the level up tactic a lot sooner. I'm not really sure why I didn't to be honest. I think it's a perfectly fine rule, but I may have just not thought it was worth it at the time. Anyway, that's the only battle I really wanted to show you. We can just skip the majority from here on. The next major difference from my last run is now after getting Surf, we have access to two new TMs, both accessed from heading east of Floroma. By surfing a short distance behind the Valley Wind Works, we have the TM for Thunderbolt just sitting there. I avoided it last time since the game corner made a portion of the game really easy, but I'm done trying to make this challenge even more difficult. I figure we'll need it to actually make some battles more consistent, and hey, I banned the game corner, not the TMs themselves. And then surfing in the opposite direction, we keep going until we hit Fuego Ironworks, which I honestly think is just the third or fourth time I've been here in the almost two decades I've been playing this game, evident with me spending far longer than I care to admit on the spinning tile puzzle. But eventually, when we get to the end, the TM for Flamethrower is there to welcome us. And with that, we can round off Pompadour's moveset, bring him back to his glory days. Well, he's still missing Psychic, but we won't get that for a while. And lastly, instead of teaching Dread's Grass Knot, I head north of Jubal after the Ravish part to get the TM for Water Pulse. I suspect I'll need Grass Knot later, and I'd rather not overwrite it with a move as it's a one-time find. Aside from that, these next few battles go pretty similar to last time. Water Pulse even makes Byron's gem less of a slog to go through. On the way to Snowpoint, I even grab the item Light Clay, which makes moves like Reflect and Light Screen last for 8 turns instead of 5. This should have been something I picked up last time. Unfortunately, with our gem battle against Candice, Flamethrower's lower attacking power almost bites us as it's not enough to pick up the kill on Frostless. Pompadour doesn't care, however, and still hits her, but this very easily could have gone bad. There's an argument to be made that Fire Blast is actually better than Flamethrower as it only has a 15% chance to miss while being about 30% stronger, but I'd rather the rest of the game just be more consistent. Since our special moves are actually good this time, I even let Pompadour learn Nasty Plot, teaching it over Confusion as it's our least used move. This has the potential to turn him into a demon. I end up learning this during the Cyrus 2 battle, which was kind of a mistake. We came out unharmed, but had I just leveled up first, we could have swept. But with that, scale the mountain once more and we're back. This time Barry's dead to us. Once again, I target the Bronzor that I'll set up Reflect, getting a crit which I don't think really mattered. Bronzor sets up a light screen while Barry continues being useless. I switch into Bolcut, who's now holding a light clay and he gets hit with the Night Slash, which does not crit. But then Bronzor doubles into me using Gyro Ball, making staying in much riskier. I set up a Reflect anyway, so that as long as we don't get crit, we're good. Alright, we're good. Time to rest up again. After getting hit with Night Slash, Munchlex actually attacks Skuntank and paralyzes again. This isn't as bad as last time as we haven't actually used Duon yet, but I would have preferred putting her to sleep. Instead, I switch into Dreads, who immediately gets confused. We're off to a pretty rough start. But at least Skuntank can't move this turn as Munchlex hits another body slam, which even crits. Maybe I was a bit hard on Barry earlier. The Berry keeps her out of heal range. We charm Skuntank to lower its attack as it can't move, and Munchlex restores its health with Swallow. A whole 5% of it. Good job Barry, you're almost too useful. Unfortunately, this time we hit ourselves as Munchlax also gets confused. And Skuntank targets Munchlax with Poison Jab. And Munchlax even attacks again, bringing Skuntank low. I figured Dreads can handle the rest, so as we snap out of confusion, she uses a Water Pulse. That does nothing. I kind of forgot about the light screen. But both Pokemon once again target Munchlax. And Munchlax hits itself. Honestly, a pretty good turn. Well, Dreads definitely has it from here, and Skuntang goes down, with us surprisingly being at almost full health. Bronzer even does us a favor, finishing Munchlax off, and out comes Rapidash. 
I shouldn't say that. Munchlax did good this time. Finally, it's only Golbat on Jupiter's side, so I figured the best way forward is to target that. Rapidash has a different idea, targeting Bronzer with Fire Blast, just barely doing over half. And we use a Confusion on Golbat, doing even less than half. That Light Scream's really starting to hurt. The Golbat doesn't have a super effective move for us, but poisons us instead. At least Rapidash is the one confused this time. The Light Screen wears off, but Rapidash hits itself, and we just miss the kill with Confusion. It doesn't matter as it wastes a turn trapping us with Mean Look. Rapidash finishes Bronzer off the next turn with Fire Blast, and we finish off Golbat with Confusion. And Mars even does us a favor by starting off with Golbat. I figure we can just position ourselves for an easy sweep, staying in on the bite. Rapidash hits another Fire Blast, doing just less than half this time, and we cut Golbat's attack in half with Charm. I bring up Pompadour as he dodges Golbat's air cutter, and even Rapidash uses Will-O-Wisp, cutting Golbat's attack even further. Now we're perfectly safe to set up nasty plots to our heart's content, but we can only get in one as Rapidash hits Fire Blast and then Golbat perishes to its burns. Finally, it's Perugly, and surprisingly, a plus two flamethrower just does a little over half. Thought it would have done more coming from myself. Well, at least Perugly targets Rapidash with Aerial Ace instead of us. We use another one, and Heracross manages to tank a four times effective Aerial Ace, using a Brick Break in return, ending Perugly, and the Nuzlocke. How are we still not done yet? That honestly went really well. I'm sorry, Barry, I was getting emotional last time. You actually can be useful when you use real moves. I would have still preferred using my own Pokemon, to be honest. And this wasn't even the scary battle. Coming up, we have our final battle with Cyrus. And those concerns I mentioned earlier, well not only do they still exist, but are now five times as worse. So much so that even our pixies run off into the void, forcing us to follow and tail to wrangle them back up. Cyrus now has five fully evolved Pokemon, three of which are dark types while the other two are still pretty hard hitters. On top of that, three of them are pretty speedy, two even being able to outspeed Pompadour. Not only that, but his ace Pokemon, which is one of the Pokemon that can completely outspeed us, even sports our favorite move this run, Night Slash. Meaning, even if I play this perfectly, there's just a 1 in 8 chance that we lose the run. And just to add the cherry on top, he leads with a special attacker, which is much harder to set up on, as we can't spam charm. But I do have one new special item for the occasion. I get Bidoof to show off his raw strength, intimidating the late guardians back into submission. And let's take on the final galactic battle. Cyrus leads with Houndoom, and I send out Bulk Heart. Since we can't really lower its special attack, we need to rely on Light Screen to halve its damage. Houndoom, however, uses the first turn to burn us. We may as well put it to sleep, so I use a Yawn, and he uses his first Dark Pulse, which Bulk Heart eats. However, after the burn damage, I don't really know if he can survive another and burn damage the next turn. So, I stall a turn using a Rest as Houndoom falls asleep. This time Bulk Heart's holding a Light Clay, so we'll need to wait two turns to wake up, but now we have a free turn to switch into Dreads. Houndoom does wake up turn 1, but then misses Will-O-Wisp, and we use our new move. We set up Stealth Rocks, which does damage to Pokemon on entry, more depending on if they're weak to Rock-type moves, which funnily enough, all of Cyrus's Pokemon are. This will make it much easier for Pompadour to guarantee kills, even with a weaker Flamethrower. Now we just need to get rid of Houndoom as fast as possible, and we still have the move for it. Dreads eats the Dark Pulse and uses a super effective Water Pulse, which doesn't even do half. God, Mesprit is so bad. I wasn't expecting much, but I was at least hoping for a two-hit KO. This actually puts us in a rough position. The idea was that I could KO Houndoom and then charm the next Mon, as all the remaining Pokemon are physical attackers, and then Pompadour can set up. Now I need to rethink the entire strategy, as taking three more Dark Pulses will be tough. Houndoom does get confused, but we can't really rely on that. Pompadour's return will probably kill, so I bring him in. However, we lose the coin flip, and Houndoom uses a super effective Dark Pulse, revealing my ace in the hole. This generation introduced damage reducing berries depending on the type of the move used, meaning with the screen up, we eat. The issue is though, that was needed for a completely different Pokemon, and now I don't even know if I can survive an attack from it. We can outspeed the next turn to indeed finish Houndoom with return. Next is Hornchcrow, and with the rocks up we can guarantee a free kill with Thunderbolt, but out comes the Pokemon that could straight up kill the run. Weavile is faster than us, has a high attacking stat, and has Night Slash, which has a high chance to crit. Without our berry, I don't even know if we can tank a non-crit, and despite its looks, it actually has pretty decent special bulk, meaning I don't even know if we can kill. The rest of this battle comes down to this one turn. Weavile uses Night Slash, and Pompadour survives on 5 HP. Seeing that HP drain sank my heart, but there's still the second phase. We use Flamethrower, and it picks up the kill on Weavile. That was a Pokemon I was scared of since I started this challenge, and it didn't even get one kill on us. But it's still not over. Up next is Crobat, who we could have killed thanks to Stealth Rocks if we weren't slower than it. We need to switch out and regroup. 
Thankfully, the other two are still fairly healthy, so I figured the best move is to bring out Dred's Charmer down. Well, it turns out this thing also has Air Slash, a special move. So with help from Toxic and a flinch, I'm forced to switch out after only using one. Now we have to rely on a bit of luck once again. I bring out Bowl Cut on the Air Slash, who still needs to stall out two turns of sleep. It uses another one, putting us at 54 HP, meaning it did 27 points of damage. Simple Maths tells me we're not surviving two more. The previous one did 24 points, so maybe it was a high roll, but we're really cutting it close. And the next one misses, meaning as long as we don't see a crit and don't flinch, we're in the clear. And even the next one misses. Bulkhead wakes up using a yawn, and now we don't even need to risk Mesprit's life. I stay in to take an air slash, which of course flinches us, and Crobat falls asleep. Now I have a free turn to bring Pompadour back out, and it's a 20% chance we lose. And Crobat stays asleep. A super effective Thunderbolt picks up the kill. And finally it's Gyarados, but we outspeed. A 4 times effective Thunderbolt electrocutes Gyarados and gets us past what was possibly the most difficult fight I've had in the Legendary only run. This one actually had my heart beating as we were playing with some very dangerous odds. And unlike Fantina, we would have lost like 10 hours of progress. And I just don't know if I had it in me to do it all over again after that last battle. But with that, we can catch the final legendary of the run. Alright, that was a joke. We still have to get the final badge first. Well, with us past probably the hardest section in this run, let's wrap up the actual gem quest. Volkner is going through a bout of depression, so it's up to us to put him out of his misery. Volkner leaves with Jolteon, who uses a charge beam, which also raises his attack. Doesn't really matter as we set up a light screen cutting its attack in half. I even stay in the turn and Jolteon already resorts to Iron Tail. We lull it to sleep. May as well stay in for one more and set up a reflect as Jolteon falls asleep. Now into Pompadour, who can set up one nasty plot, no, two nasty plots, and a plus four flamethrower one shots Jolteon. And we finally get a new psychic move. Return's been good to us, but it's time to ascend. A plus four extrasensory one shots Raichu, a plus four extrasensory one shots Luxray, and a plus four extrasensory one shots the Ace Electivire. It has been a while since we had a sweep, and Arceus knows I needed one. Pompadour may actually be able to solo the entire rest of the game but that's no fun. Speaking of Arceus, with all 8 badges, as is now tradition, we can get a new legendary. But here's the thing with Sinnoh, most of them are actually pretty good. You have Pokemon like Heatran, who's been a staple in competitive formats. Darkrai, who has a massive special attack, is very fast, and even gets a broken move with an 80% chance to put the opponent to sleep. And Cresselia, a bulky, somewhat fast psychic type with levitate. Hmm. But there is one legendary that I am convinced Game Freak absolutely despise. A legendary who I feel is deserving of some redemption, and also a very fitting choice after my last run. I am of course talking about the big man himself, Regigigas. Regigigas is a legendary that sports a massive base stat total, one rivaling the box legendaries themselves, and I think deservedly so, as it's basically the father of the legendary golems. It should be one of the strongest Pokemon. So why they decided to nerf him will never make sense to me. Game Freak gave him the ability Slow Start, which halves both his attack and speed for the first 5 turns he's in battle. And not collectively, this counter resets every time he switches out, meaning once he's in, he needs to stay in for 5 turns before being useful. And until generation 8, he didn't even get to learn Protect to store turns, a move almost every other Pokemon can learn. Why? He's not even that strong on a grander scale. Like I said, he's basically as strong as a box legendary, which I think is fair considering its lore, but Game Freak to this day still doesn't think so, as even in the game that stripped Pokemon of all their abilities, they still decided to program just one. Wanna guess which one? Poor Reggie Gigas. We need to redeem him, and that's enough for me to make him part of my team. Editor Yash here, and uh, I found a shiny while getting B-roll. Like, I just wanted to get some footage of Regigas' slow start prompt, and I thought, okay, there's a drag pole, I'll just go run into that, and it, it was a shiny. Sure was. I don't actually know where I'm going to put this in the video, but I definitely wanted to be in the video, so if you're just hearing this out of, like, context, then, uh, I guess it made it in. But let this be a lesson. Regigigas brings nothing but good fortune to those who appreciate its value. This was the only Pokemon I ran into. For lots, by the way. Onto the second phase. I'm not, I'm not shiny hunting, that's not a thing I do. There was also Fionn, but that's like barely even a Pokemon. I wonder if there's even one person that has Fionn in their top 10 Pokemon list. But now the question is, 
how do we even make Regigigas useful? On the surface, you look at 160 base attack and 100 base speed and think to yourself, okay, half that, so you have 80 and 50. But that's not quite how stats are calculated. There are also IVs, EVs, and natures thrown into the mix. And the total from that is what's halved. So Regigigas is actually even worse than he appears. Assuming he has no EV investment, a neutral nature, and very middling IVs, he is about as strong and as fast as Sanshrew. And that's us being generous. If we do fully invest EVs into him, he's as strong and as fast as a fully EV'd Spinarak. I'm not even exaggerating. In fact, Spinarak is actually stronger and faster. So yeah, we're gonna need to give Gigas a little boost. Thankfully, we have quite a few TMs that he can learn, which our Pixies can't. And one of his good qualities is that he has a really good starting moveset. And while I did say I'd ban the game corner, just for Reggie Gigas, I think he deserves it. There are TMs which we can only get there that I don't think are too busted. Rest and what the hell, substitute 2. Reggie Gigas can't learn rest. So not only are we taking 5 hits, but we also have no forms of recovery outside of berries. But at least he does get substitute, which is something. Game Freak really did him dirty. But that's about as much as I want to get for now. We're so far into the video that I just want to get this over and done oh, for fuck's sake. Alright, one more battle with this guy. Barba leaves with Storaptor, and the first thing we do is set up a boosted reflect as Storaptor U-turns out. Out comes Heracross, but that works perfectly for us, as best he come out while the reflect is active. I stand to use a Yawn, and Heracross uses Night Slash. Still no bug move. I switch straight into Pompadour, risking the crit, but we eat as Heracross falls asleep. Now we have a free turn to Nasty Plot up. A plus two, super effective extra sensory gets the one shot. It's nice having a real psychic move. Staraptor comes back out, right into a thunderstorm. Next is Roserade and Extra Sensory. And oh no, it's Snorlax. It has a high special defense and a super effective crunch. If only we set up a move that halves physical attacks. Well, we're in danger, but we do have the Pokemon to save this run yet. Into our star, Regigigas. And wow, look how little crunch does. Alright, Snorlax outspeeding is a bit soul crushing and we get paralyzed. Oh no, Regigigas. But we still push past. Crowning hits a super effective boosted revenge, doing a little over half. Wow, bet Pompadour wishes he could have done that. Another body slam activates a berry and Crowning hits another revenge, getting the kill. Whoa, we may actually just make it through this. Rapidash's turn and I think we need to set up a reflect again. Into bowl cut as the room becomes sunny and I set up a reflect and Rapidash burns us. Well, I use a yawn and we should be fine now if I hadn't forgotten that it has fire blast for some reason. After the burn, we survive on just 4 HP. Okay, I actually did mess up there. Well, we can switch into Pompadour as Rapidash springs into the sky for some reason. It falls asleep that turn, so he plummets back into the ground. Now a free turn to use Nasty Plot, and a plus two extra sensory is enough to pick up the kill. It's finally Barber's last Pokemon, Thunderbolt. Oh god, Pompadour's gonna sweep this game. But wait, we've got the Elite Four next, and would you know it, the, the, the first one's a bug type. Well, Psychic's weak against bugs, so yeah, Pompadour's just useless for this one, right? If only he learned a rock move. Well, I guess there's only one golem for the job. A golem, dare I say, that may just save this run. The first Pokemon to stand in the way of our intrepid behemoth is Yan Mega. However, I lead with Bowl Cut first. While I have no doubt in my mind that Crowning can get any sweep he wants, why not give him a little bit of help? While Light Screen would have been better here, I use a Yawn instead. And Yan Mega raises his speed with the ability Speed Boost. While Bowl Cut would be outsped and die to another hit, we have someone who doesn't care for concepts like speed. We unleash our ace, Regigigas. He does need a moment to get started though. Bug Buzz does a fair amount, but Yan Mega falls asleep. We have a free turn, so I'll use Substitute. Now Bug Buzz does pass through subs, but that works out in our favor, as I'll still be up against the next Mon. This even triggers our berry, bringing our health back up. Yan Mega stays asleep, and we can let out a super effective Ice Punch. Whoa, look at that damage. While the full restore does wake Yan Mega up, Crowning gets a crit. What a man. And now we need one more, meaning less damage taken. But the intimidating aura of Crowning proves too much for Yan Mega as it uses a U-turn. Not doing quite enough damage to break the sub, and runs off bringing out Heracross in its stead. A fighting type Pokemon. Well, I was hoping for more time, but this lines up perfectly as Crowning gets his act together. That's right, he can do even more damage than the brutality you saw earlier. 
and now he even outspeeds. Ice Punch does almost 50%. Heracross hits with a strong close combat, but a sub just absorbs the damage. And after having his defense lowered, another Ice Punch finishes off a Pokemon that had the advantage over us. Next is Vespaquen, and guess what move it's weak to? Though she proves to be a worthy foe, as it survives an Ice Punch from the mighty crowning, even at his utmost best, truly a formidable Pokemon. It however uses a futile Defend Order, as the coward before it already used up the Forest All. Another Ice Punch brings us closer to victory. Yenmega comes back out for redemption, but it's in vain as without Speed Boost, we're the ones who control the field. One more Ice Punch. I can at least respect the sentiment. Next is Scizor, who we don't actually have anything for. Instead, I let Crowning ease a fairly strong x boosting its revenge, doing well over half. Now we can outspeed hit an Earthquake, finishing Scizor off. And finally is Drapion, a Dark-type Pokemon. Thank Arceus above that we have the power of Regigigas on our side. Our Psychic-type fairies would have been in jeopardy. Ignore the fact that it doesn't actually have any Dark-type moves. But now all we need to do is Drapion outspeeds. Well, Cross Poison does nothing, and we can hit back with a super effective Earthquake. Not getting the kill. I underestimated Drapion. Well, Crowning has no issues shrugging off another attack. A final earthquake guesses through the first member of the Elite Four. How dare anyone even insinuate that Regigigas isn't a valuable and viable party member? They should count themselves lucky that Regigigas even graces us with his presence. He pulled off a whole sweep, all by himself. Not a single one of my other Pokemon could have pulled this off. Next is Bertha, the ground type member. If only we had a super effective move. Oh wait, there's one Pokemon that does. Crowning. His rampage is far from over. Whiskash is the first Pokemon on the chopping block, and we start off with the best support. Another yawn, but Whiskash opts to use Sandstorm for passive damage. I bring out Dreads on the Aquatail as she falls asleep, and begin cutting its attack with Charm. Eventually she wakes up, hitting us with a much weaker Aquatail, and as the Sandstorm triggers our berry, we bring back Bowl Cut. As the Sandstorm subsides, we set up a light screen, and then a yawn, and then a reflect, with Whiskash finally setting up another one as it falls asleep. Whiskash stays asleep as I set up a substitute, but unfortunately we're taking some damage because of Sandstorm. Credit where it's due. Whiskash wakes up the next turn using Earth Power, still not breaking the sub thanks to the screen, and we head back with a boosted revenge. Well, you know, Whiskash is kind of bulky, so can we really blame Crowning for this? Earth Power still can't break through, and Earthquake brings her below half. The Sandstorm subsides, but Whiskash is smart, as it uses another, knowing it's the only way to get damage off on me. One more Earthquake brings Whiskash into heal range, but a wasted turn is even better for us. Earthquake. And Crowning has now come to his senses. I decide to let Whiskash outspeed once again, breaking our sub, and a boosted revenge brings her below half. One last Earthquake finishes her off. That crit would have been helpful earlier. Crowning's just sending a message. Somehow Bertha sends out the absolute worst Pokemon she could have, possibly because of the moves I've revealed, and now it has to take a 4 times effective Ice Punch from a completely focused Regigigas. Poor bastard. Hip Howdon's turn, and she eats the Ice Punch, which does just over half, but then she challenges us, using a yawn. Now we either kill and fall asleep, or retreat. Crowning doesn't even wait for me to utter the latter option. The word retreat's not even in his vocabulary, as he'll have to rev up again. Down goes Hippowdon as Crowning takes a victory nap. But not only is Crowning a monster on the battlefield, but he's also a humble tactician when he needs to be. Indeed, all this time he was purely stalling as Dreads needed to learn how to tie knots. A four times effective Grass Knot gets the one shot on Golem and a 4 times effective Grass Knot gets the one shot on Rhyperia, winning us the second battle of the Elite Four. Dreads may have gotten the final blow, and don't get me wrong, that is something worthy to be praised, but we know who the playmaker was that positioned us for such a feat. The next member, he leads with the Dark Side Pokemon that we're very familiar with, and Crowning refuses to let it do any more damage to his subordinates. Flint also leads with Houndoom, and Bolkot is familiar with his role. We outspeed to use Light Screen as Houndoom sets up the sun, which could actually be of concern to us. We even use a Reflect as we eat a Dark Pulse. Yawn for good measure on another, and into the king. We eat a Dark Pulse thanks to Bowl Cut support, and with Houndoom asleep, we have a free turn to set up Substitute. The sunlight even fades. Houndoom stays asleep, and we use a super effective Earthquake, which even with Crowning half asleep, brings Houndoom to its knees. Well now Flint wastes a turn using a full restore, as we use another bringing Houndoom back to his place. Houndoom uses a last ditch flamethrower, not breaking the sub, and goodbye Houndoom. 
Next is Infernape, a fighting type Pokemon. But we have a sub up, meaning we eat a Flareblitz. But it breaks the sub. Earthquake does well over half, and though our reflect wears off, Regigigas has his sights set. Infernape still outspeeds, hitting a strong Flare Blitz, but we still had our berry, bringing us back above half. Earthquake gets another kill. Flareon never had a chance. Earthquake gets its first one shot. Rapidash is out, and we outspeed. One shot. And finally, it's the Ace Magmorta. One shot. And Crowning picks up his second full sweep. Regigigas isn't even doing this to prove a point. He's doing this because it's all he knows. Can the final Elite Four member even put a dent in the behemoth? Bolkart, you know the drill. Mr. Mime sets up a reflect. Bolkart sets up a light screen. Mr. Mime sets up a light screen. Bolkart sets up a reflect. Mr. Mime attacks with a pathetic Thunderbolt, and we just yawn. Into the main character on another weak Thunderbolt as Mr. Mime falls asleep, giving us a free turn to set up a substitute. The reflect wears off as they have the inferior screen setter, and we use a strength doing well over half, as even their light screen wears out. But next up is the Ace Gallade, a part fighting type. How will our normal type fare? Gallade lets out a stab, super effective drain punch, and it doesn't even break the substitute. We use a strength that does about a third as our light screen wears off. Gallade switches it up to use a stone edge. That had a chance to miss, and finally breaks through. And our strength brings Gallade low as it uses a berry to set around half health. But that was all the time Regigigas needed to snap back into a lucid state. He releases his raw strength, getting the kill. Next is Alakazam, who manages to hit the focus miss, but we were prepared with a damage weakening berry. And this was actually supposed to be for Gallade. A strength picks up one more kill. Espeon's turn, and it uses a psychic doing way more than I was expecting. But Crowning has a family to get home to. He survives on just 6 HP. A strength just misses the kill. Poor Crowning has exerted too much strength today. Now, this is a bit scary, as Espeon has Shadow Ball, and is pretty strong with 130 base special attack. On top of that, it's also in heal range, so if we switch, we could just waste a move. But above all else, Crowning wants to go home and see his kids, so I bring in his second in command. As Lucian heals, putting us in a worse position. Espeon outspeeds using a Shadow Ball, which does over half, but Bolkut uses a light screen, guaranteeing we'll survive. Yawn. And now we bring back someone who's been benched for the entire league so far. Pompadour makes his return, and Espeon switches into the weaker signal beam, doing even less damage thanks to our screen. As Espeon falls asleep, we have a free turn to use Nasty Plot, revealing we outspeed. I use another as we should be able to survive another attack, and Espeon stays asleep. And a plus four flamethrower gets the kill. Finally it's Bronzong, but with us set up and a flamethrower in our arsenal, we can put the final member of the Elite Four behind us. And that's the entire league. But there's still a score to settle. Why did we lose our 8th run? Was it because of Barry being an idiot? Well, Barry's dead to us, so best not speak ill of the deceased. Was it because I played poorly? Of course not, don't even entertain such ideas. No, no, it was because a certain someone didn't show up on time despite being the champion of the region facing ruin. And even when she did show up, who fought Cyrus Cynthia? Was it you? Is your ace in the self? Oh, you, you don't even use in the self. Strange. Could it have been me then? The ten-year-old? Who you dragged into an alternate dimension never once explored? Opened up by a man threatening genocide? No, surely not. Cynthia leaves with Spirit Tomb, and I send out Bowl Cut one final time. The first thing we do, of course, is use a light screen, as Spirit Tomb sports a full special moveset. It has both Shadow Ball and Dark Pulse, which it'll use randomly as they do the same amount of damage. We would prefer Shadow Ball. We can survive another, so we use a Yawn, and it uses another Shadow Ball. Hopefully we can get a third one. Into the Golem that has carried the world on his back. Crowning. But Cynthia reads the switch using Dark Pulse instead. Of course. Spirit Tomb falls asleep. What do we do with the free move? We set up Substitute. Earthquake's our strongest move, but we just need one for later. Spirit Tomb has the ability Pressure, which uses up twice as much PP, meaning we can only use four at most. Doesn't matter as Cynthia switches out. I know I'm surprised every time this happens, but I don't really see the AI switch out all that often. Togekiss is unaffected by the Earthquake. That isn't really what I wanted to see, as Crowning's still a bit drowsy from his nap, and Togekiss has a super effective move, Aura Sphere, which thankfully we eat. The sub's still not breaking. Crowning hits back with a nice punch, doing about a quarter. Look, he's just tired. Another Aura Sphere breaks Crowning's substitute, and Ice Punch brings Togekiss below half. 
The light screen wears off, putting us in a bad situation, but Crowning's got something else on his mind. Losing his substitute, something he created with his own hands, reminded him of his dear children. What if that was one of them? Unforgivable. Fatherly instincts kicking in, Reggie Gigas gets his act together. Crowning out speeds, using his true strength, a super effective ice punch gets the kill. Cynthia sends out Lucario, a fighting type Pokemon. Poor fool. Do you think Crowning's Rampage cares about type disadvantages? Crowning out speeds, hitting a super effective earthquake, getting the one shot. But next up is Cynthia's own ace. Garchomp. We don't outspeed and Garchomp manages to hit Dragon Rush, doing a lot of damage. We use a berry, healing some of that HP back. Crowning hits back with a 4 times effective Ice Punch, just missing the kill. And Citrus Berry brings Garchomp back out of heal range, meaning he's attacking the next turn. Look, Regigigas has been amazing, the only reason we made it so far. But I can't afford to let the other mons take a hit from Garchomp now, especially since they're pretty underleveled. Regigigas wants to go back home to see his kids, but he also knows when it's time to protect the newer generation. And Garchomp uses Earthquake. I'm sorry, Crowning, they could have dodged it. Regigigas has been regarded as the worst legendary for years now. He truly has everything working against him. Even the company who created him hates every fiber of his being. Under too much pressure, he retreated into an entirely different region and generation, just so he wouldn't embarrass his kids. But he never abandoned them. He still works tirelessly to make sure his flesh and blood have a safe place to stay, even those who want to study abroad. Most of his children aren't regarded as being anything special, but Reggie Gigas is still proud. Proud that they didn't turn out like their old man. However, if this league is anything to go by, I think Reggie Gigas has a lot to be proud of. In fact, I think we should all strive to be like him, constantly trying to make the best of a bad situation. Even if we have a slow start, we can still get our acts together. Just like Regigigas, who survives on 1 HP, hitting back with a final ice punch, ending Cynthia's ace Garchomp, and the Nuzlocke. In Generation 4, the debut of Sinnoh, a new legendary was introduced. A legendary widely regarded to be the worst, and here he is, single-handedly defeating the champion who has been widely regarded as the best, all while underleveled. Truly a champion himself. Okay, yes, there were three more Pokemon left, but was a nasty plot sweep from Pompadour really going to be the hypest way to end that battle? Oh look, it's both of the adults that almost sent us to our demise, and forced me to play through this entire game two times. Oh hey look, Rowan's congratulating Crowning. But with our legendaries in the Hall of Fame, should they really deserve to be banned? So, like my last run, I thought I'd put them on the tier list. Just a reminder, these are tiered relative to other legendaries. A mon in the C tier here is not necessarily a C tier mon in general. And a quick rundown of what each tier means. S is for Pokemon that I think are way too overpowered and should be banned. A is for Pokemon that I think are very strong but should be banned depending on your confidence. B is for mons that I think are pretty good but don't really see a reason to ban them. They're likely just as good as regular Pokemon that wouldn't usually be banned. C is where I think the legendary begins to struggle. They can still have value on a team, but other Pokemon probably also fill the role just as good or even better. And finally, D is for legendaries I don't even think are worth the time and resources getting, and are overshadowed by other regular Pokemon. With that said, let's get the main man himself out of the way, Regigigas. He swept the entire league all by himself. Surely that deserves him a spot in the S tier. Okay, time to come clean. This may be a bit of a shock for you. I didn't actually need Regigigas. A Zelf would have probably swept all by himself. Sorry I deceived you. But you know, after actually using him, I think he can sit above D in the C tier. While this is very much a mon that you have to get to work for you, once he gets going, his stats are obviously very good, with some great moves too. And with decent bulk, he could actually be useful in some cases. Of course, most other Pokemon would probably be better, but he is in the steaming pile of toilet feed I thought he would be when I first started. On to Mesprit, and I'm sorry, she's going straight to the D tier. Yup, even lower than Gigas. There really is nothing she does better than any other psychic Pokemon. 
and what she can do is mediocre. As a legendary, there is no reason for you to go out of your way to catch her, even if she's a guaranteed encounter. Yuxi, on the other hand, is certainly a bit better. I think there are other psychic mons that can handle his job better, namely Bronzong. But if you want to set up a speedy screens, or more importantly, Yawn, he's a great support mon. No reliable recovery hurts for sure, but I think you can still sit in the lower end of B tier. Support is still a very important part of the team. And finally, Azelf, who I think I can pretty confidently put right into the S tier. Our first one. Now, while I do think these legendaries are pretty shit as a whole, individually, Azelf can be a monster who can sweep the entire game. On top of having insane stats, he gets great coverage, especially if you allow the game corner and then Nasty Plot, which is probably the main reason he's here. After some initial support, you can safely set up Nasty Plots, and with his speed, he will likely never take a hit. And a mon that has the potential to break the game is something I would usually consider banning. So S tier it is. And I think that's that. This video went on for far too long. This was just supposed to be a quick win that would get me in the mood to start writing scripts again, and ended up taking me so long. But hopefully I was able to get some of the heat off of the Reggies and show some people that that can always be worse. If you like the video, please consider liking and subscribing as the validation really does help with my ego. But where can we go from here? Do you have any suggestions for a group of legendaries that might be even worse? Please let me know in the comments below and I hope you look forward to more videos in the future.